I was fired for, you know, one violate hours of service. I said, well, get me your logbook out. And I looked at this guy, oh, really? Exactly 11 hours every day of driving time, exactly 10 hours off duty. You're running up against your 70 every single day. Every pre-trip and every fuel stop takes you exactly 15 minutes. And wow, you were at a Walmart distribution center and you got unloaded in 15 minutes. I'm just shocked. Isn't it amazing how this truck stop in the middle or rest area in the middle of Wyoming at 2 in the morning shows up exactly when you run out of hours? My talk is about what are your rights when you won't break the law. Uh, before we get started, I'm just going to say one thing real quick. Now, it's nice to be around people who talk my own language. I, I consider people ask what business you're in, I say trucking. I'd much rather hang around with drivers than hang around with attorneys. Attorneys are incredibly boring, all right? And if any of you say anything offensive about attorneys, I don't have a problem with that. One thing James said interesting earlier here today, he talked about the, the lease purchase programs where they get you in a truck and they tell you how great it's going to be and the only way you can make your payment is by running 8,000 miles a week and then you come out with a $200 paycheck and then they drive you out of the industry and then they, you quit. The one thing he forgot to tell you, there's trucking companies that'll go and sue you for the unpaid balance of the leases. Well, let's talk about this law called the STA, AA, Surface Transportation Assistance Act. Now, this may surprise you, and I'm going to try to stick close to my outline here, but it was way up here, but uh, I talked to you about what kind of things it protects. It's right here on the first page of your material. It protects complaints. It protects testimony and safety-related proceedings. It protects refusing, refusal to drive in violation of the law and it protects refusing to drive based on a serious apprehension of serious injury, and it protects accurately recording on your records of duty status. Now, what do you get? How does it protect you? This isn't a criminal law. It's not gonna put any trucking company owner in jail. It's not gonna put you in jail. The law will allow a driver a fire because he's engaged in one of these, what we call in the law, protected activities. It's gonna allow that driver to if he brings the claim and if he's successful, and we're gonna talk later about how you succeed. You know, and nobody likes to do lawsuits, okay? But this is if you've really been illegally fired. What can you get? One, you can get your job back if you want it. Two, you get back pay if you've made efforts while you're unemployed to you know, look for work, made reasonable efforts to look for work. You can get damages for emotional distress I had a lady recently who was fired, we'll talk about this case a little bit, she was fired by Prime because she wouldn't drive through Donner Pass in a bad snowstorm. And when she came back, all of her trucks were out of the truck. She had to remove everything from the truck. She had no way of getting them home. When she got, finally got a bus ticket home, her house was foreclosed on and she had to live in a shelter and get her food from, from shelters. Now, that's the kind of case judge in that case awarded her, I believe, $50,000 in emotional distress damages. So you can recover for that. Traditionally, they're not that high, but when you have right circumstances, you can recover for your emotional distress damages. Had another driver, a driver for Nationwide Transportation. I do use names, okay? Um, <laughs> bring it on. Um, <laughs> Yay! Transportation. He wouldn't drive with a broken spring. It was a broken spring on the driver's side front. And he was uh, asked to drive it back from St. Joe, Missouri to Omaha, Nebraska. He wouldn't do it. He called DOT on the company. DOT came out, put it out of service, and he was left abandoned with no money at a Love's truck stop in St. Joe, Missouri. Okay? That case will be going to trial in a couple of weeks. That's the kind of case that might support an award of punitive damages. What else can you get if you win one of these cases? Well, I like kind of the best part. That's called attorney's fees and costs. <laughs> now, I've been called, I, I gotta, you know, I like the social media stuff. I'm trying to figure out the Twitter and the Facebook stuff. I got into the social media when there were two trucking boards, one called www.truck.net, and the other one was called layover.com. So some of you, if you remember back that, my handle was called Opie, O-P-I-E. I owe the success of my law practice to getting out the word about this law. Uh, I did have some, uh, I did write for the trucker for a while and I wrote for a publication called Moving Out and another one was called Trucking USA. 
And I started writing for them right before they, I think that's what they were called, they went uh, out of business uh, right after that. But, um, you know, now the social media is how I get business. And I get business not because I'm out there soliciting cases, but because I'm getting the word out on this law. This law empowers drivers. It says, if I have a bald tire, I may, indeed the regulations say you must, refuse to drive it. If I've got an audible air leak, I can refuse to drive it, and I have rights. And you're not going to win every case, so I'm not going to try to paint a rosy scenario. If you prepare a case properly, you can. Uh, I have, you have rights, you're empowered. If you're going to write up every day one light bulb out on your trailer, if you're assigned the same trailer every day, one marker lamp is out, they can't fire you for that. That's a protected safety related complaint. It is against the law for them to do that. So anyway, I work on a contingent fee, so I'm not a money grubbing lawyer. I only make money if the driver makes money. One of the other things you can get is relief. The statute uses the term that the court may order the abatement of the violation. Well, the violation is the illegal firing or the illegal blacklisting on DAC. And the courts will order the DAC report cleaned up. It will order the personnel file expunged and the DAC report cleaned up. So those are one of the things that you can get under this law. Now, this is we're going to move into uh, page two of the material. Procedure. Some of you are going to find this somewhat remarkable, but when you bring one of these cases, you've been fired. You're out there, you've been told that, you know, you delayed a load. You had delay of freight, service failure, hot load, client, you had to get it there, and you pulled over and went to sleep at a rest area because your head was nodding off. And we know it's against the law to drive when you're impaired due to fatigue. So impaired due to fatigue that it's unsafe. All right? So all of a sudden the load's late, and you're fired for that. Where do you go? No, you don't go to the Department of Transportation, you don't write to your congressman, and you don't write to the EEOC. You go to the United States Department of Labor, Occupational Safety and Health Administration. That's where you gotta file one of these cases if you've been illegally fired because you won't drive in violation of the Department of Transportation regulation or because you've made safety-related complaints or because you've accurately recorded your duty status. You file with OSHA, you have 180 days to do it from the date of the firing. Don't delay. It doesn't start, you know, when your unemployment runs out. It starts today, if that's when you're, when you're fired or that's the date they took the adverse action. OSHA has 17, we call these whistleblower statutes. If you make safety related complaints to the employer or the government, you are a whistleblower. If you refuse to work in violation of the law, you are a whistleblower. OSHA has 17 of these statutes. The SDA is just one. It's their uh, third, large, third most number of cases. There's a similar law for airplane pilots, train drivers, bus drivers, there's environmental whistleblower laws. There's general workplace protections for people who complain about electrical cords running across the carpeting, etc. Now, OSHA has some absolutely outstanding investigators. They're sort of like the EEOC. Has anybody here ever been to, you had a complaint of any sort of discrimination against the EEOC? You don't need to raise your hand, but the OSHA investigators work similar to what an EEOC investigator would do in a sexual harassment or a discrimination case. They have outstanding investigators. The problem is they're overworked. Congress keeps adding statutes that OSHA investigates these discrimination or retaliation complaints, and uh, unfortunately they don't add a lot of OSHA investigators. OSHA sits on the case for a while, and then, shocker of shocker, the driver usually loses at OSHA, okay? So it's not like I'm the, you know, it is like, I'm from the government and I'm here to help you. Well, there is an outlet. Once OSHA rules against the driver, we have seen an increase in favorable cases towards the driver with the Obama administration. You know, there's policy set from the Department of Labor. But after OSHA rules, a party can object and you get to a judge. Now this is not, you know, like Judge Judy or Judge Wapner, and it's not like Judge Ito in the OJ trial. This is a judge who's specially employed by the Department of Labor. And now it would go to the Department of Labor, much like a regular 
court case would, called an administrative law judge, and you go to trial with the administrative law judge. In my opinion, these are among the finest judges of the country, and I've appeared in all sorts of courts, representing drivers and truck, I did used to represent trucking companies a long, long time ago. And uh, these judges hold a trial, and they issue a decision. And then there's an appeals process. So, this is all done through the Department of Labor. There is one outlet. If you don't want to go to the Department of Labor, you can move the case into a federal district court, which I would never, ever recommend, you know, if there's not been a final decision within 210 days. Now, that's how the procedure works. That's the overview. Now, a couple of realities. If you're going to bring one of these cases, you know, probably 85 to 90 percent of them all settle. But if you're going to bring one, you better be prepared for the long run because they can take a long time. Trucking companies, particularly one with brown trucks based in Atlanta, a large one, UPS, they will appeal it to death. So that's an overview of the process. Complaints to the company. Those are what are called internal complaints. Now the no brainer part of it is a complaint to the government. Let's give you some examples here of things that have been found to be protected activity to the government. Driver, his name's Griffith, drove for a company called Atlantic Inland Carriers. They're affiliated with Shilly out of Remington, Indiana. They were one of their companies. Couldn't get a repair made to the trailer. Company said, no, it's cheaper to get it done back home just keep driving, we'll dispatch you in the direction of home. We all heard that one, right? Mm -hmm. Cheap right at our home terminal. <laughs> now this driver had a real concern. He's, you know, he didn't think it was safe. And he had driven with it for a while. He did. The company kept telling him, we're going to get it repaired. We're going to get you up to Winston-Salem. I think he had a U.S. gypsum load on it, I'm trying to remember. And we're going to get it repaired. They got it to repair shop. They canceled the repair order. We're too expensive. We'll get it home. Well, this driver, he didn't like that. And he drove 26 miles to a scale at Eflin, North Carolina. I assume some of you probably know where the scale is. And he had the vehicle placed out of service and complained to DOT and he was fired. And the trucking company admitted at the OSHA stage of the investigation, we fired him because he trucked the truck to a scale and put it out of service. In that case, the Department of Labor's administrative law judge and their internal appeals courts court board in affirm that that is a protected safety related complaint. Mr. Shilley's Schilly, affiliate Atlantic Inland was ordered to reinstate Mr. Griffith to his previous job, same pay terms and conditions of employment, pay and back pay, were not awarded emotional distress damages and uh, they ordered him, got him to clean up his DAC report, remove the adverse information. Now, while that case was going on on the appeals, Atlantic Inland Carriers shuts down on December 31st and a company called Shilly Specialized takes over the entire truck's drivers and operation about two days later. You know, same drivers, same trucks, different name. And ultimately, you know, sometimes you have to go through a process of suing a successor business saying that they're really one and the same operation. But that's what's interesting about this law. The law says no person may, essentially no person may retaliate against a driver. Because the driver is engaged in one of these protected activities. Well, no person includes the owners, if the owners are involved. It includes the dispatcher, if that dispatcher is involved in the, in the firing decision. Anybody heard of a case called, New, a company called New Rising Phoenix? Out of Missouri? Yeah, nice company, right? Yeah. They shut down, and uh, but the owner's on the hook, at least for now, because he was the person who made the, the uh, firing decision. Other types of thing, internal complaints that are protected. Internal complaints have to be filed with the employer. Now, an internal complaint, one, A, filed with the employer, B, it has to relate to a violation of a commercial vehicle safety regulation. And three, it has to be based upon a reasonably perceived violation. So. Your daily vehicle inspection reports can constitute an internal complaint if you're writing up all tires, etc. and they say, hey, don't put that on there. You know, what if you get stopped by DOT? We've all heard that one, right? Well, if they fire you for putting it on there, that's a protected internal complaint. 
There was one case, this was not my case, a case a number of years ago where a driver was talking to another driver over the CB. The case was called Moravec versus HCM Company. And that driver, one driver, was overheard to say to the boss, or overheard to speak to another driver on the CB, you know, that dirty SOB's got us working again. I'm so tired, I'm falling asleep at the wheel. And the boss overheard it, and they got into it over that. And the Department of Labor held that to be a protected internal safety complaint. Uh, I don't know if today's Department of Labor would, but if you have those types of complaints, uh, you know, you're, you're protected. It has to relate to a reasonably perceived violation of a uh, commercial vehicle safety regulation. A um, case several years ago involved repeated complaints about the same items. This was a case called Carter versus Martin Transport. Anybody ever heard of Martin Transport of Mondovi, Wisconsin? Mr. Carter was sent out to pick up a truck that had been pulling a trailer that topped a bridge, and the, I believe the driver got fired. And he kept the truck at, you know, he was sent out to pick it up, I believe it was low on oil, had um, bent exhaust stack, um, it had leaks due to blow-by, and he kept complaining about it. And uh, ultimately, he was fired. And this is, I, I used to put this on, I used to do a sheet, I tried looking for it before I did the, uh, did my material. I used to have something I called stupid dispatcher tricks. But they, they Martin's HR department put on the memo, why was driver fired? Overall unhappiness with Martin's equipment threatened to call DOT on us. You know, the HR people are the ones who are supposed to keep you out of lawsuits, not get you into lawsuits. But his, Mr. Carter's complaints about oil leak, bent exhaust stack, including one of his complaints was, the sleeper berth smells like urine. And the judge found the complaint about the sleeper berth smelling like urine to be a protected safety-related complaint. What does the regulation say on sleeper berths? 393.76, I believe, says, Sleeper births shall be suitable for sleeping, right? Now, I'm not sure I would ever want to go to trial just on a complaint about a sleeper birth stinking like urine and the mattress not being in good shape. But these are the types of internal complaints that you can make, and they, it is against the law for them, for a trucking company to fire you for it, to put it on your DAC report. The interesting thing about Carter versus Martin is what they put on his DAC report. They checked the box, excessive complaints. They were ordered to clean up his dad report, put him back to work, and pay him uh, damages for emotional distress and to pay his attorney's fees. What type of complaints would be protected? Uh, statements to the media about violations of DOT regulations. I had a yellow driver call the, call the TV station in Chicago on himself after the yellow wouldn't take care of a problem with the truck. Um, testimony and grievance proceedings. This would apply more to the union driver. But it could apply to you if you were testifying in an unemployment compensation case if the testimony or the proceeding related to violations of DOT regulations. For example, if the driver company alleged a service fail and that's why you were fired and the driver was alleging that he was not fired for misconduct. So that type of testimony is protected. Uh, evidence gathering. There's a case cited in the material on page three called Mashad. Mr. Mashad was secretly photocopying time cards to prove hours of service violations. Department of Labor held that to be a protected activity against retaliation. Question over here? Yes. Go ahead. Why do you have to wait till you get fired to see what's written on your personnel records? Do you have um, the ability to request to see your personnel records to see what kind of comments are being made? And to add your own comments, uh, if, they're, if you don't feel like um, they're objective, but they're more subjective. On, on this individual law, you can't do anything until they do something to you. As to personnel records, whether or not you have a right to inspect your personnel records would depend on the individual law of the state uh, in which you are employed. So I know in my state, Minnesota, an employee has an unfettered right to receive, view his personnel records uh, at uh, any time upon reasonable notice. But that depends on the law of the individual state.